Welcome everyone to the Learning Collaborative for Colorectal Cancer. I'm pleased to be focusing on this topic today uh, regarding disparities in colorectal cancer screening. We have five presenters. I'm going to introduce all five and then turn it over to uh, Dr. DeRosa. And as soon as Dr. Rosa is done, Ben, you can just share your screen and get started. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have a few minutes left for any questions. Dr. DeRosa is a public health research associate and instructor at the College of Nursing and Population Health Education Center at South Dakota State University. Dr. DeRosa provides data analysis support to the South Dakota Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, Cancer Registry, and Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. Ben Tienzvold has worked at Sage Project Consultants as a project coordinator since 2013. He's the community outreach coordinator for the South Dakota Community Health Worker Collaborative and also um, coordinator for the South Dakota Diabetes Coalition. And then from Horizon Healthcare, James Valley Clinic, we have Samara, oh my, sorry, my page went missing. Uh, Samara Contreras, uh, she is a interpreter and receptionist at the clinic. Erica Lesman with Sanford Health in Sioux Falls. She is the cancer education and outreach coordinator and Sarah Romeo, who is the nurse navigator for Falls Community Health in Sioux Falls. Thank you all for joining us today. And Dr. DeRosa, you can take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brooke, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, talking with you today. Uh, my presentation will be about disparities in colorectal cancer screening. Um, and here are the, um, the objectives for this presentation. So I'm going to be talking about the epidemiology of colorectal cancer in the United States and South Dakota. I also be going to be presenting the CRC screening rates in the population of South Dakota, and then uh, discuss some of the factors that contribute to CRC screening adherence. So we know that the burden of colorectal cancer in the United States and in the world is quite significant. Um, so colorectal cancer is the fourth most common cancer. Um, we had in the United States in 2018, more than uh, 140,000 uh, new can uh, colorectal cancer cases. Um, it is the second leading cause of cancer death just um, below um, here lung cancer, as you can see. And we know that 90% of the cancer cases uh, are those among uh, age 50 and older. Now look at the trends in CRC incidence uh, and mortality rates. As we can see, there is a significant decrease uh, in incidence. Um, the average of uh, declining of colorectal cancer from 2016 and 2018 is 2.5%. Uh, and when we're looking at mortality, we also see a significant decrease, especially after uh, 1980s. And uh, from 2012 and 2019, we see an average of 1.9 decrease in the mortality rates for colorectal cancer. Now, when we look at CRC instance and mortality rates by age group and sex, what we can see here, uh, we have three different age groups. So we have 0 to 49, 50 to 64, and 65. So that average that we saw before uh, in terms of a reduction in incidence and mortality, it's, it's driven by uh, the older age groups. Uh, when we look at the younger uh, adults, we see that there is a different trend. So for instance, incidence is going up, uh, higher for male than females, uh, and mortality as well. We see a different pattern when we compare with the older age groups, uh, again, being higher among male than females. Now, looking at the trends in colorectal uh, uh, instance rates in South Dakota, um, and I apologize, there is a typo here, it should be 1, 2012 to 2018, uh, sorry, 2002 to 2018. So as we can see here, uh, we, so we do see a, a, a similar pattern where uh, colorectal cancer incidence rates are going down uh, on average 2.5%. Uh, and then when we look at by age group, again, we see that uh, 
2.9% reduction in mortality um, in incidence, uh, I'm sorry, it's among age 50 and older for male, and then 2.7 among females. And it's actually not decreasing for younger adults. Uh, the rate is actually considered as stable. Now, looking at mortality, uh, as we saw for the national, uh, we also see a decrease in CRC mortality rates in South Dakota. And, uh, and as you can see in the historical trends here, for ages and uh, 50 and older, we see this very clear, this decline. However, uh, I did try to look for, um, to look at the mortality rates for younger than 50, but because we have small numbers in the state, I was not able to see that. And so I'm not showing for uh, younger, but we do see that the driving that it's occurring, the falling trends, are due to um, low, uh, that decreasing mortality be, uh, among adults 50 and older. Now, looking at the gender and race disparities in colorectal cancer uh, incidence rates in 2014, 2018, so five year aggregate data, uh, we do see that there is a difference uh, in, in incidence rates between males and females, and this goes for all uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, this is a national uh, data, so we do see that uh, the instance rate is higher among Blacks um, than uh, compared to white or Asian uh, and American Indians. Now, looking at the race disparities in colorectal cancer, South Dakota and the United States, uh, we do see that the instance rate is higher among American Indians compared to uh, other races, to white. And also, um, we do see that it's, when you compare with the national, um, it's significantly higher. Then mortality, we see the same pattern when we see American Indians with uh, mortality rates higher than uh, white in South Dakota. And here, uh, a similar rate between uh, South Dakota and the national. Oops, here. Um, when we look at the gender disparities in colorectal cancer, we see a similar pattern as we saw uh, previously. So male, um, males have a higher incidence rate uh, than females, and the same pattern is seen for mortality with a 50% higher among uh, men than women. Look at geographical disparities in colorectal cancer in South Dakota. So we do see a variation by county in the rates. Um, and so the lighter the color, the lower the incidence rate, and the darker the colors, uh, higher incidence rates. Now, looking at the CRC incidence mortality reduction, uh, we have different uh, factors that affect that. We have changes in health lifestyle, so reducing the risk factors, those are the modifiable uh, risk factors that we can work on. The other thing that uh, it's very important is the screening, the early detection. And so um, I thought about sharing this slide. I thought it was very interesting. When you look at the number of uh, colorectal, uh, colonoscopy uh, uh, tests going up, we directly see an uh, incidence rate of colorectal cancer going down. So just showing the importance of the screening in the early detection and reduction uh, of incidence rates for colorectal cancer. Now, then we're gonna be talking a little bit about screening. This is the trends in colorectal cancer screening uh, rates in South Dakota. So as you can see over time, we are improving uh, the screening rates in, in South Dakota. And when we compare with the Health People uh, 2030 target, which is 74.54%, uh, we see that we are uh, doing a great job and then also compared to the, to the United States, uh, the prevalence is 74.2, so also uh, better than the national average. Then looking at the colorectal screening overall prevalence in 2020, in, uh, comparing South Dakota with, uh, let's say, surrounding states, what we can see here is that South Dakota and Minnesota, they have similar uh, screening rates. So South Dakota, as we saw, 76 0.2% and Minnesota is 77%, but uh, as I said, doing better than uh, the other uh, surrounding states here. So big variation in the country. 
looking at age and gender disparities in colorectal cancer uh, screening rates in South Dakota. Uh, as you can see here, we do see a difference by age group. So the average was 76.2%, but when you look at the 50 to 59 age group, we see that we are uh, below that average. Um, doing better with 60 to 69 and 70 to 75. Uh, females are also uh, doing better than males with 77.6% being up to date uh, to the USPTF recommended colorectal cancer screening. Now looking at a screening rates by social demographic factors, uh, we have here American Indians income, uh, low income. So here is just 50, 15,000 to uh, close to 25,000 and less than high school. Uh, diploma, so we can see that the percentage it's uh, again uh, lower than the average uh, that the state average in South Dakota, seventy six point two percent. So, you know, just we have to always remember uh, when we are looking at the state, this is the, the state average, but we do have variation by other factors, and so we have to remember that. And this is important because. Um, we also have to think about geography disparities, right? And so here in South Dakota, uh, we can see that the prevalence of colorectal cancer screening does vary among county. And so the lighter the color here is the lower the prevalence of screening, the darker the color, the higher uh, prevalence in colorectal screening in South Dakota using the birth data 2020. The other thing that I'd like just to show to you, uh, and this is using the national data, it's the colorectal cancer screening uh, uh, differences between uh, uh, by race and, and ethnicity. So as you can see here, we have Hispanics uh, doing, um, having a lower uh, screening rate when compared to uh, other races. And this is important because uh, South Dakota is changing, the diversity in South Dakota is changing over time. And so as you can see here, uh, in 2010 and 2020, the diversity index has changed from 27.4% to 35.6%. And so this is using census data and the diversity index is a measure that um, measures the probability that two people chosen at random will be a different will be from different racial and ethnic groups. And so the higher the, the index, uh, it indicates that most almost everyone in the population has different racial and ethnicity characteristics. And this is for the overall. When we look by uh, specific races or ethnicities, here it's for Asians. So I thought about showing this to you as this changing over time uh, in South Dakota, we had 1.3% of Asians and now we have 2.1%. So we did have an increase of around 8,000 people in South Dakota and the counties uh, with uh, higher uh, uh, percentage of Asians um, are showing this map. Then the same thing we have for Hispanic or Latino population. So in 2010, we had 2.7% and now we have 4.4%. And so a percent change of 75.1%. And uh, just to give you an idea about the increase in the population about the Hispanic or Latino population, it's more than 16,000 people. And so again, showing the counties here, it's Pido, if I'm not mistaken. And so showing the counties that we have a higher population of Hispanics. And I think that this information may be helpful for when we talk about screening uh, among minorities. Here it's just comparing uh, the map that we, we saw before in the, um, the variation of uh, colorectal cancer screening by county. And here is a map that I created a while ago looking at uh, showing the social vulnerability index. Um, and this is an index created by CDC. There are um, four themes. And the one that I'm uh, presenting in this map, it's the minority and language status. And so the darker the colors mean uh, counties with a higher number of people that uh, are minor from minority groups that don't speak English at home. 
or they are from minority language and minority um, in terms of uh, race status. And so, as I said, the darker the colors uh, higher the, the index. So the index go from zero to one. And so, as you can see, uh, the higher the index, so here is 0 0.8. So we means that we have um, uh, more uh, vulnerable population in terms of minority groups. And when we compare those two maps, they kind of overlap um, some of the counties. So for instance, those two counties, we can see, uh, you know, a lower screening rate. Uh, and so I thought about sharing uh, this map with you to look at screening rates and minority groups yeah. by county. Now, looking at barriers in CRC screening, uh, you probably have seen this slide before. Uh, you know about uh, some of the barriers, but I thought about sharing with you. There are different factors affecting CRC screening. Uh, you have uh, the patient level, we have gaps in knowledge, fears of the adverse effects, cost, it's a big one, transportation. But we also have um, uh, barriers at the provider level, for instance. So um, providers mention limited patient visit time, um, you know, gaps in knowledge about the recommended guidelines in terms of materials and methods. You know, uh, there are some issues that have been reported in, in terms of the um, lack of electronic database, reminders, um, uh, and, and track of uh, uh, documentation. And so the other thing it's related to fit test, for instance, you know, uh, so when patient comes to the health clinic, some mentioned that they lived without the kids, so then, uh, or they don't return the kid for some reason. And so those are some of the barriers mentioned in the literature. Uh, some other factors that, um, factor barriers and facilitators that have been mentioned in the literature in this study. Um, it's uh, from uh, quite uh, new, it's, it, it's from 2021. Uh, bar barriers, it's a big uh, 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 lack of health insurance, I'm sorry, it's a huge barrier. Also psychological factors has been reported as well. Uh, so fear of finding out about a cancer, uh, logistics uh, in terms of knowing how to conduct the test, um, having uh, knowledge. Of course, you don't have to do anything, but you know, it's, it's in it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, the other health related factors like mental health. Uh, or previous trauma. In terms of facilitators, uh, patients do mention that having, uh, you know, a health professional mentioning uh, the importance of the, the screening, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very important to them. And here, as you can see, um, are the preferred channels for receiving CRC screening information. And so, 60% of the respondents, for instance, they mentioned that having a conversation with the doctor uh, was very important to them to receive screening, and then a website, emails, and online um, patient health portals. This was a study carried out uh, among FH, um, FQHC patients, uh, around 400, almost 500 people. And where, what they report in this study is that this population, um, they did mention that fear and concern, it's a, it's a very important barrier, why they uh, don't don't want to get screened. And so uh, here are some of the, their thoughts about uh, colorectal screening. So they are afraid of uh, finding a cancer. Of, as I mentioned before, financial difficulties, it's, a, it's an important aspect as well. And, and logistics, especially for rural areas that they, the patient needs to drive sometimes long distances. The other studies uh, that I thought was interesting and in showing uh, to you, it's uh, the overall and test specific barriers to CRC screening. And so uh, absence of symptoms was a large one among uh, the 10 uh, top 
um, factors that prevent people to, to want to be screened for CRC. So they think they don't have the symptoms, they don't need to be screened. Um, if they don't have a story of uh, family history, uh, they don't think it's important to get screened. So there is a lot of lack of awareness. And they did mention that they would like to, the patients mentioned they would like to have more information um, about uh, the, the prevalence of colorectal uh, insurance coverage, also how the test uh, needs to be performed. They have confusion understanding, uh, sometimes fears and concern about anesthesia, um, and they don't understand really well sometimes the step-by-step -step, um, of the screening test. And so uh, here mm -hmm. they, they do provide some um, um, the, some of the barriers by uh, screening test. Um, and so, for instance, uh, here in the fecal occult uh, blood test, you know, they talk about some logistics, confusion. So sometimes what it seems easier and straightforward for the provider, sometimes it's not for the patient. Now, the other factors that are important to mention is the social determinants. So um, not only in terms of uh, logistics, but also uh, we do know uh, based on the evidence in the literature is that the uptake is higher among women than in men. And we saw that in the birthers data as well. Um, we know that it's lower among the youngest as well. And the other thing that they found is it's that areas of um, higher deprivation there were the areas where they saw uh, lower screening rates. So showing the, uh, they mentioned the importance of targeting uh, populations with uh, risk of low compliance, uh, using not only the social um, aspects, but also the geographic um, factors as well. And here a similar study as well, showing the SES deprivation. Um, and so here when they run, a, um, um, regression model, they found that the factors predicting low uh, screening rates were SES deprivation, uh, home rental, uh, perception of low health care quality, uh, no routine checkup uh, within two years, and also perceived uh, discrimination. And so if you're talking about SES, I thought about uh, showing, uh, the, again, this is uh, the social vulnerability index, but this is the socioeconomic status um, uh, theme. So the previous one that we saw in the other map was this one, the minority, so they have four. And so here um, I'm showing actually, um, it's the overall vulnerability. And so what we can see here is that, again, the darker the colors, the higher the vulnerability. And when we see those two maps together, they kind of overlap again. So seeing the areas with low screening rates and areas with a higher vulnerability index in South Dakota. So maybe this can help you uh, target some populations uh, that we know that are probably being under screen. Here is, here is just showing a clinical trial where they look at serial text messaging and did work pretty well in this study. So it was a clinical trial among 440 people. Uh, they had a control group which was just receiving the normal text message, just one text message uh, saying that they were, the patient was overdue to screening. And then the intervention group was uh, people receiving several uh, text messages and also receiving the free test kit, um, everything um, out of, uh, they didn't have to pay for anything or they had insurance or um, they had grants that would provide for free the fit kit. And so what they found was that in the control group, they had uh, only 2.3% had undergone the screening and in the intervention group, they had almost 20% of the population uh, uh, receiving uh, the recommendation, completing the whole screening process, so like a tenfold increase. Now, we do know that uh, with COVID, uh, we had a huge impact uh, in um, reduced access to care, delay routine care, uh, late stage diagnosis for several cancers, including colorectal cancer. So, um, you know, we are estimating an increase in cancer mortality. Uh, and so, uh, one thing that I thought about also showing, you know, is that, um, as you can see here, is the civil unemployment rate uh, nationally, and this is by race, so here uh, red is black, uh, Hispanics uh, white, and I'm sorry, uh, white, and then here Asian, 
And so as you can see, there was a decreasing uh, unemployment rate, but then with the pandemic, we see this dramatic increase. And we know that unemployment, uh, it's, it leads to insurance loss. So this is a very important factor that um, we, we know that's happening, it's the reduced access to care. And so probably gonna have more people that are uninsured and if cost it's a problem for them to receive CRC screening, um, you know, this is an important factor to uh, keep in mind. Um, and here, um, again, just showing the, the impact of the COVID-19, uh, you know, in CRC screening, and this was in 2020. So the numbers are probably, uh, especially this one's probably going to be larger. So they did see uh, an, a decrease, a drop in colonoscopy, you know, 90 percent, uh, and they are expecting, uh, you know, uh, more than 4,000 people uh, excess uh, deaths from CRC. Um, and so, you know, um, this this study uh, did show what we thought that would happen in terms of find uh, diagnosing less colorectal cancer cases. And so what happened in this study here, they look at different GI uh, gastrointestinal procedures and cancers, and they compare uh, 2020 with several years, uh, 2016, 17, 18, 19, and they look at the cancer incidence. And so here it's colorectal. So comparing 2016 to 2020, you see a reduction in the number of new cases found, um, and then 17 as well. So we did see that in 2020, we, uh, found, we are finding less cases because of the impact in, in access to um, screening, uh, follow-ups, and uh, all of that during the, because of the pandemic. And so just to summarize this presentation, uh, although we have seen a decrease in CRC instance in mortality in the United States in South Dakota, uh, we saw that uh, the pattern is not the same for all age groups, it's higher. Uh, we do see this uh, decrease, especially among ages uh, 15 and older. We saw also uh, disparities in CRC instance and mortality, as well as uh, in screening. Uh, and we briefly mentioned a disruption of CRC screening and follow-up due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, you know, intensify efforts uh, will be necessary to reduce the burden of CRC and reduce the inequalities uh, in CRC outcomes. Um, I think that's all I have uh, to present. So uh, thank you so much. I've, I'm not sure if you're taking the questions towards the end, is that right, Brooke? Yeah, we'll wait until the end. So okay. Ben, if you want to share your screen, you can go ahead. Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Perfect, hello, everyone. Let me get my screen shared here. So while I pull that up here, my name is Ben Tinswold. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Community Health Worker Collaborative of South Dakota. So I know many of you have heard about community health workers by now in South Dakota, but thought I would just take a quick moment to share some more information about CHWs as well as a funding opportunity that's now available to start a community health worker program within your organization. So hopefully I'm sharing the right screen here. Can everyone see my presentation here? I know we're like two years into using Zoom at this point, but I still always get nervous that I'm not sharing the right screen and not sharing my presentation here. So um, first I'd just like to jump into what is a community health worker. Um, I won't read through it, but the Community Health Worker Collaborative and South Dakota Department of Health have both adopted the American Public Health Association's definition of a community health worker. I'm more of a visual learner though, so I really like to go with this visual, showing that on one side, the community health worker is embedded within the community they might speak the same language, be from the same culture, have the same lived experiences, um, have the same chronic disease. Um, and then on the other side of the circle there, they might um, work with the social services or health services. They might be directly employed by the health or social services and really help that patient uh, connect between their community and the health and social services. So we have two titles for community health workers here in South Dakota. 
Um, primarily, we use the title of a community health worker, specifically a certificate level community health worker. That's someone who's completed an approved CHW training certificate in South Dakota and works under the American Public Health Association's definition of a CHW. And then we also have the community health representative title. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of community health representatives before, uh, but they're essentially CHWs. They utilize that title as it's been an established profession within um, tribal programs since the 1960s, 1970s. And so the community health representative is a uh, workforce that is certainly part of the CHW workforce, but certainly can be separate as well. So the scope of work for CHWs in South Dakota is threefold. The first is health system navigation and resource coordination. The second is health promotion and coaching. And then the third is health education to teach or promote methods and measures that have been proven effective in avoiding illness and or lessening its effects. And when looking at the scope of work, the health promotion and coaching and the health education are both meant to not be a new um, piece of coaching or health education, but rather the CHW focusing in further on what a health professional has already shared with a patient. So I just wanted to quick touch on community health worker reimbursement. I'll be sure to share these slides with Brooke and have her email these out to everyone. So I'm gonna zoom through the Medicaid reimbursement slides really quickly here, but want you to have the opportunity to go back and take a closer look at these as well. Um, but South Dakota does have CHW reimbursement for uh, through South Dakota Medicaid. And so looking at qualifying conditions, cancer is one of the qualifying conditions. And so a patient is required to have a qualifying condition and or a qualifying barrier. So qualifying barriers would be geographic distance, lack of phone, which this one really means that an individual might be utilizing the emergency room instead of their primary care provider, not necessarily that they don't physically have a phone and then cultural or language communication barriers. So the scope of work is identical for Medicaid as it is overall for the state of South Dakota for community health workers. So that works out in our favor because the work that we're hoping CHWs are able to do is the same as what Medicaid will reimburse for. Um, I won't go further into reimbursement here, just letting you know that per hour a CHW works with a patient they would be reimbursed individually or their agency that employs them would be reimbursed $41.78 an hour. So in really simple math, just know that one hour of services is $41.78. Looking at the suggested um, pay scale for a CHW in South Dakota of $16 to $21 an hour, you can really, as an organization employing a CHW, stretch two hours or so of that CHW salary out of one hour of a, a reimbursable um, service provided by that CHW. There are additional requirements as well as outlined in the billing and policy manual through South Dakota Medicaid. Uh, the big one is that the CHW services must be provider ordered. Currently in South Dakota, a provider is identified as a medical doctor, a nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, or a midwife. Uh, but we're looking to add additional um, providers as well to that list when working with South Dakota Medicaid. And the other big thing is that the CHW must complete an approved training program. So currently at the certificate level, Lake Area Technical College offers a CHW training certificate. And then outside of South Dakota, Minnesota West and Northwest Technical College, both in Minnesota, also offer a CHW certificate. Uh, all three programs are online, and then Indian Health Services Community Health Representative Training Program is also an approved training program. However, it's only accessible for those who work with the tribes and tribal programming, so it's not accessible to the general public to complete that CHR training program. Southeast Tech is also looking to add a CHW uh, training certificate starting next fall, so fall of 2022. And then training programs from other states can also be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Now this gets a little confusing, but we do have some additional training programs that can be reimbursable as well. Um, again, I'll let you take a closer look in these 
into these when the presentation sent out to you. But essentially the community health worker at the certificate level can also train in these evidence-based programs to add on to the work that they provide within their community. Uh, but there's also an opportunity for individuals who have trained to lead these programs uh, to provide these programs uh, and receive reimbursement through the CHW scope of work using the appropriate CPT code. So in other words, somebody could not be a community health worker, but could provide uh, a Better Choices, Better Health program within their organization, and they could be reimbursed specifically for providing that program using the CPT code for community health workers. There's certainly a lot more to learn about training and reimbursement, so I invite everyone to visit our website, chwsb.org, and then you can click on both the training tab and reimbursement tab to learn much more about the reimbursement and training. So a quick overview of the Community Health Worker Collaborative of South Dakota. Um, the CHWSD uh, is an extension of the South Dakota Department of Health Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. And we launched in 2020, but the Department of Health has been working on CHW efforts since 2015. Um, in 2019, Medicaid announced CHW reimbursement through a state plan amendment. And then in 2020, the CHWSD launched and we developed a strategic plan. And then in 2021, uh, we received funding through the CDC Health Disparities Grant. And I'll talk about this a little bit further in a couple of slides, but we now have funding available to start CHW program development. So our strategic plan focuses on five key areas, awareness, training, workforce development, reimbursement, and career ladder slash lattice. And, Career lattice is really another way of saying cross-training. So cross-training an individual who's already working to also receive the CHW training and work as a CHW. So our full strategic plan can be viewed on our website. It includes all of the goals, objectives, and strategies that we're focusing on for the next few years. Uh, knowing that this was a super quick introduction to community health workers in South Dakota, we do have a great resource available on our website. It's the South Dakota specific CHW planning and assessment toolkit. It's a four module toolkit. It takes about two hours to go through. Uh, there's two versions of the toolkit. One version uh, is self-guidance. You can jump in and out as needed. The other version is the exact same information, but it requires you to go through it start to finish before you can receive your continuing ed. So take a look at that toolkit. The four modules cover the background of community health workers, both nationally and in South Dakota. Uh, module two looks at planning. So where would the CHW fit within your organization? What work would they do? Things like that. Module three looks at implementation. So actually hiring, training an individual to be your CHW. And then module four looks at evaluation and sustainability. So how can you make sure that your program is working? And how can you make sure that your program is able to be sustainable into the future. Additionally, for community-based organizations, so those out of the medical and clinical field, we are developing a community-based planning and assessment toolkit that will launch next January. That toolkit will be three modules focused specifically on developing sustainable CHW programs within community-based organizations. So as I mentioned, uh, the South Dakota Department of Health did receive a CDC grant called the Health Disparities Grant. Specifically, this grant um, includes a strategy to build and expand an inclusive public health workforce, specifically community health workers. So a lot of the groundwork was already done within South Dakota uh, through our past work, as well as through the development of the Community Health Worker Collaborative in starting in 2020. And so we really have a great opportunity to utilize these funds to really fund the startup costs associated with starting a CHW program. So here in South Dakota, we have 300 plus awards available, approximately $50,000 each per state fiscal year. And these can uh, be awarded to clinical or healthcare organizations, community-based organizations, as well as organizations that are looking at a career lattice or a cross-trained uh, CHW to really provide funding to start up the CHW program within that organization. So the funding can support the awareness of the CHW profession, as well as the training or cross-training of an individual to become a community health worker. 
So the funding can offset not only the tuition costs for that certificate level training, but also pay the hourly salary for that individual as they go through the training. And then there's also funding within this opportunity to cover the workforce um, costs and organizational development to really make sure that that program is sustainable moving forward. So this is a great opportunity uh, to apply for. The funding is currently available. Um, the funding will be available until the grant ends or the funding runs out. So if you visit chwsd.org slash funding, you will see our request for applications page. There's now a recorded webinar on there as well that goes into further detail as to how to apply for the funding. Um, but there's sample budgets available. There's the two application files. It's a pretty simple application. Um, it just includes a fillable budget template as well as a project narrative form that asks um, eight different questions that require about a paragraph response each. So certainly an opportunity for programs across South Dakota to look into further. There is plenty of funding to go around and then some, so don't feel like you have to rush to apply for the funding, but at the same time, just know that the earlier you apply for the funding, um, the more time you'll have. Time is really our, our concern at this point. The funding is there, we just have a short time frame at this point for allocating these funds. So just wanted to provide a quick overview on the community health liquor work here in South Dakota, specifically our request for applications, knowing that that really allows individual sites to apply for funding, hire an individual or cross train an individual and really start a successful and sustainable CHW program. So I will share my slides as well with Brooke, uh, but thank you for the opportunity to present and I will wait until questions to see if there's any questions. Ben, our next three presenters will speak about activities or services that they are providing in their uh, communities to reach disparate populations. So Samara, I will have you go first and then Erica and followed by Sarah. Okay, I'm hoping that my video is working. Um, your video is not, but we, yeah, your video is not, but we can hear you just fine, Samara. Okay, um, so my name is Samara Contreras. I am one of the Spanish interpreters slash receptionist here at James Valley Community Health Center in Huron. Um, my coworker Cassidy Riggs, who is one of the colorector cancer champions couldn't be here today unexpectedly. So I'm just gonna proceed as what I do as my part as an interpreter slash receptionist here at James Valley. So our clinic is one of the clinics participating and the grant project with the South Dakota Department of Health and as well as the CDC. And we are all working hard to improve our colon cancer screening rates. Um, we have seen that over the last year, we have increased our screening from 44% of patients to 63% of patients. 46% um, of the patients do not speak English. So we have worked to reduce barriers in many ways in order to achieve our goal. Um, we have all worked together to reach this goal, everyone from interpreters to nurses to the providers here at the clinic. Um, at our clinic, we have seven full-time receptionists, six of which are bilingual, two we have that are Karen, four are Spanish, and one of our Karen interpreters also speak Burmese, so that's really nice having her here as well for that. Um, all of our front desk staff has attended at least like a educational session on colorectal cancer, as well as exact sciences, which is webinars that also help us effectively translate the importance of colon cancer screenings in all the patients, as well as understand the screening options that we have to offer, and as well as the insurance coverage and costs. Um, something that has really helped for myself is getting on the front desk staff on these meetings have helped with the positions as far as fielding billings and, you know, any questions that regard for like the IFOB and color guard, as well as what options we have to offer and helping patients understand how to use the IFOB and the color guard um, collection process. So any questions that they have, you know, we're their front, front desk to help them um, and those types of questions. Um, in addition to the person interpreters, we have two iPads, which are equipped with language line solutions. I don't know if you guys have heard about that, but it's a really nice technology that we have. It has like audio and video uh, capabilities that has access to um, around 240 languages. 
So the patients really prefer like the video chat option if, if they seem to understand it much better than through the audio um, only interpreter that they have for that. But the iPad also has access to the internet and we have several links available to show patients the step-by-step -step process on many things, including like screening colonoscopy uh, for procedures and prep, um, the Cologuard collection that we have, and as well as the IFOB collections that we give to the patients. Um, all of these tools combined is what our clinic has done to reach the minorities. And we've seen that it has improved our colon, colon cancer screening rates um, significantly um, here for the James Valley Community Health Center. So that is all I have that I need to say. And I'm sorry if I went fast. It's my first time speaking in front to a group, but um, it's been a pleasure to be here in front of you guys um, to speak about my, my and my coworkers, um, you know, process that we do here at the clinic. Thank you so much, Samara. And Erica? Yeah, so I, I work with Sanford, so I don't have a specific clinic. I kind of go wherever it works best for the client. I have found that when I'm working with the refugee and immigrant population, mostly refugee, that identifying key community leaders within those populations really helps. So not only that are they my interpreter that I have found, but they're also um, well-respected in the community. So it kind of um, breaches the trust that, that a lot of the population have because that interpreter is working with me and is already kind of has a foot in the door in the community. And I'm very fortunate the fact that I don't have a specific clinic. I do all home visits, sometimes groups. And so uh, I'm doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one or if there's multiple people in the house doing just a lot of very um, individual education with the interpreter present. So not only do you have trust because they usually know the interpreter, but they're also in their own setting. So they're a little bit more likely to ask questions um, because there's not a lot of people around. Like uh, if I'm talking specifically about colon, they'll start talking about their bowels and they probably wouldn't talk about that otherwise. So it just kind of creates an area of safety for them. Um, the first presenter did a really good job of, of highlighting a lot of the barriers. Trans, obviously with my refugee population, language is a huge one. Sarah is following me. She's actually, her Clinic Falls Community Health is where I send a majority of my patients because they're very language friendly clinic. Um, and Sarah, I mean, you'll, you probably already know does a, a phenomenal job with the CRC screenings and stuff. And so there's a lot of collaboration there. But uh, when I do the individual home visits, I really have not, the further I've gotten along, the more I don't translate everything because a lot of the languages that I work with, like the Burmese or the Kunama, they don't read their language, especially if they're that older population that we're targeting. So I do a lot of like uh, visuals. So I have like a, um, like a table colon. I bet most people don't say that, but I do. I have a table colon that they can like pass around and look at that shows like different growth sizes and so that they can kind of visualize what a colon looks like and then I have like a flip chart that just shows like what a colon does and the percentage like as the growth gets bigger the percentage that if they find it at that stage they're they're more likely to be able to get it out and do better I do I do focus more on the screenings for colon and for everything in general that I do education on more more for the fact that a lot of the refugee populations that are coming here actually um, exercise. They come from countries where they have had to walk a lot. They do a lot of manual labor and they, and they eat pretty well. So I only like maybe touch a little bit at home visits on like, don't become an American and do a lot of fast food and eat a lot of processed foods and just keep trying to exercise as much as you can because they do a really good job at that. And then the other thing besides the home visits where I help schedule them for their appointments or we even for a period of time did a fit kit program where we handed out fit kits. So um, the previous presenter that's in Huron, she has uh, Korean speaking people, but like uh, Burmese speaking people, they're all from Burma, but we have more of the Kaya speaking people. 
and there was an older population. So I actually had my interpreter go and do groups based on where people lived in South Dakota in Sioux Falls. And we did four or five people at a time. And I actually pulled the fit kit out and showed them physically how to do it and then worked with Falls Community Health to make sure that they got those results or we followed up. So it's a lot of hand holding with that population because there's just so many barriers. And then the other thing with the groups that has helped is we did, we have an inflatable colon here. Falls Community Health has used it. It was available to like any community where you can walk through. And uh, some of the labels were in Spanish, but we also several years back, this is how old it is. We actually have CD formats, which like is pretty much going extinct now, but we did it in the top five languages so that if I went to Our Lady of Guadalupe has a gym and we wanted Hispanic people to walk through there, we had um, very like second grade level, someone in their language speaking as they walked through about stages and what to look for so that it was much more user friendly. And unfortunately with COVID, we kind of lost the person that would do the scheduling for the inflatable, but it was just a very user friendly format to get it out there for groups and stuff. So I also went fast, but I know we're low on time with one more person. Thanks so much, Erica. Sarah. Yeah. I get you here. Hi everyone, Sarah Romeo here with Falls Community Health. I'm just gonna share my screen, Screen, excuse me. I did a um, just a few um, slides here. Um, so Falls Community Health here in um, the center of Sioux Falls. And um, just wanted to give you a, so I'm speaking of the barriers of languages as well, obviously, but um, our top three languages, and these were, data points from 2020, um, Kunama, Nepali, and Spanish. 14% um, of all of our patients are best served in other languages than English. And up to date, we had 22 different languages um, that we utilize here on campus. So um, just gonna touch on a few things. Um, we do, um, to eliminate these barriers, we utilize school-based clinics. This is a little bit more outreach to the community and um, to children children and adults that are more local to their areas. So we are able to provide um, a little bit more focus connection um, to their certain areas. So it's very helpful. Um, we also have four staff interpreters here on the campus and they um, speak in 15 different other languages. So that is um, very helpful and they're very flexible just going into the rooms. Um, we also utilize LSS interpreters and the language line. One thing that we found to be very helpful for our patients is to translate our materials. Um, everything from the, the cardstock to the um, videos, we've also used the iPads and um, done different languages for the colonoscopies. Um, but I did wanna to touch on specifically on our IFOBT kits. Um, this is one thing that has helped me tremendously with our patients. Um, as you can see, this is the Hemature which I believe multiple people do use. Um, if you go to their website, they do provide this, um, these instructions in 16 other languages. Um, and I called the company and they actually sent me um, the forms. I think it was about 15 per each um, language. And they were um, cardstock, card paper that you could still send out to people. So I have utilized these um, forms, not only when we give the kit, but more often when I get a return kit that was maybe done um, improper. And so then I see their language and then I send them the form back with the kit. And that's been very helpful. Um, I did also, I know Sanford utilizes um, Kudel and the Quick View. I did reach out to them and they unfortunately only do have their instructions in Spanish and English. So um, that is kind of unfortunate, but the Hemershire, like I said, provides 16 different languages and we have really utilized that in our um, clinic. And I think that's really all, just utilizing our staff and our resources that we have out there have been really helpful. Oh, and these are our clinic-based clinics, but that is it. I'll stop sharing here.
All right. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. So just a couple of logistics. If you do have a question, um, we'll open it up now or you can put it in the chat. I will send the slides that were shared um, to everyone who registered along with the recording. And I know there were some people who registered and didn't attend. They'll receive it also. Feel free to share these with your coworkers. You'll also receive an email with a very, very short evaluation and to help us plan the next um, session too. So please um, take one minute to complete that. I did have one question in the chat that I wanted to address, um, and that was a patient saying, you know, I don't have time to do a colonoscopy. Um, you know, one of the ways to address that is there are two, actually several other options, but two that the patient can do from their home. Um, I think most of you know about the stool-based test, either the FIT or IFOB, and then the Colaguard test. So those, um, when a patient is really concerned about time and not being able to take time away from work, those are really nice options for them. They are recommended uh, screenings. They are very accurate screenings. And so very appropriate to use. They count towards your screening measures. Um, and then there, there was a second part of that question really saying, you know, col colonoscopy takes a couple of days. And I think there, there are some, you know, myths out there still about the colonoscopy and the prep. Um, certainly, you know, um, there are some dietary changes that you have to make in terms of what you can eat um, the days leading up to that uh, procedure. The evening before the procedure, you know, that's when you're going to be doing the prep that starts diarrhea and then obviously needing to be close to, to home and then the day of the procedure you would you would need to be away from work so you know sometimes clearing up those um questions that patients have or giving those other options for testing really helps. I also have a, um, a tips and tricks sheet that we've done with the clinics we're working with that uh, has uh, evidence-based messages to address some of those challenges that patients raise. So if you're interested in that, I did put my email in the chat box and you can just send me an email and I can send that out to you. Um, and then um, I do see another question here um, from Jennifer Weiss with Sanford. Um, Sarah, how many languages does Hemasure have translated? Uh, 16. And eight, 18 with Spanish and English, but everything from Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, Russian, Somali. So a lot of different ones. Thanks, Sarah. And then I did also want to share, hopefully you can all see this, um, a rack card that we have available um, from the, the Department of Health. Uh, it is being translated to Karen and Spanish and will be available to order free of cost. So I just wanted to put that plug in there too for, for those of you who um, work with those uh, populations who speak those other languages. So that will be available in the near future on the Department of Health um, ordering website. Are there any further questions? Okay, I'd like to thank the presenters for their time today. Um, one more plug I might put in there for the information that Ben presented for community health workers. You know, hopefully that's kind of got your wheels spinning um, about maybe how your clinic could apply for the funding, um, have a community health worker at your clinic or organization. Obviously, you know, can focus on a lot of different um, chronic diseases, but cancer being one of those. So might be an opportunity to be able to provide more community outreach and community-based services to your clinics and reach some of those disparate populations um, that right now, are, um, as Patricia showed, um, are, low, are less likely to be screened. Okay, look for the email from me with the information I mentioned and uh, just one more plug in to put in to complete the evaluation. And thank you all for your time today. Hope you have a great holiday season. Thank you. Thank have you. a good day, Brooke. Thank you, Brooke. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.